It is said that as many days as there are in the journey, so many are the men and horses that stand along the road, each horse and man at the interval of a day's journey. And these are stayed by neither snow nor rain nor heat nor darkness from accomplishing their appointed course with all speed. This video is brought to you by Curiosity Stream and Nebula. Why am I still here? Like many things in America, the post office predates the United States itself. It began under Benjamin Franklin, who, among other things, was a newspaper publisher who was appointed to be the king's postmaster in Philadelphia in 1737. It wasn't uncommon for publishers to be postmasters, as this allowed them to control the newspaper market. In 1753, he received a promotion and became Joint Postmaster General of America even mapping out some of the first post roads to connect the colonies. Despite the jokes, Postmaster General isn't some pseudo-military rank. It comes from French, where the adjective comes after the noun. Every post office is run by a postmaster who answers to a Postmaster General who answers to everyone generally. This is also why we have surgeons and attorneys general. As the American Revolution gained steam, the Continental Congress appointed Ben Franklin to be the sole postmaster general of the United States in 1775. The Declaration of Independence was signed a year later in 1776. He remained postmaster general until his death in 1790 when the new constitution reimagined the federal government. The Congress shall have power to establish post offices and post roads. This is from Article 1, Section 8, Clause 7. This isn't an amendment in the Bill of Rights or the opinion of some Federalist paper. This is the Constitution proper. Why did the Founding Fathers think this power was important enough to include? Well, that's what you're here to learn, isn't it? In 1792, the General Post Office was established and inherited only a few hundred miles of roads and 75 individual offices around the country. There were more than 75 cities in America at the time, so this was a problem. Up until this point, even in Europe, the ability to send letters through the mail was a privilege reserved for the wealthy in very large cities. If you lived on a farm, you might never get a piece of mail in your life. Congress wanted the mail to be accessible to everyone, and by 1800 there were over 900 post offices and over 20,000 miles of post road, which is just a road that postal workers can use. This would eventually include most highways and all interstates, waterways, and railroads. There are so many post roads now that it's not even worth counting. This is part of how Congress funds highways to this day. The post office was basically the colonial internet, and the majority of what they delivered was informational. Newspapers, advertisements, and government announcements. If you didn't live in a city, this was your only source of information. The current tax situation, community event calendars, election information, even primitive weather forecasts all came to you through the mail, along with letters from grandma. This access to information was so important that in 1802, Congress mandated that no other than a free white person shall be employed in carrying the mail of the United States on any post roads, either as a post rider or driver of a carriage carrying the mail. The Postmaster General at the time thought that if black people carried the mail and had access to news and information, they might eventually learn how to read and write and demand their freedom, or shut down the mail entirely. At the time, Haiti was going through a successful slave rebellion and American congressmen wanted to prevent that from happening here. This ban lasted until the Civil War. My dearest Emma, we often talked about finding a little piece of land out west, and with the recent Homestead Act, it looks like that dream may become a reality. I sure hope they open that up to the slaves, though. Seems awful silly to free a bunch of people and then give them nothing to start with. Sure hope that doesn't come back to bite us in the future. If we ought to be a country where every man is created equally, we should all be given the same opportunities. I suppose that's why Lincoln freed the slaves in the South and allowed them to work in the mail, perhaps even delivering this very message. And now that Lincoln has given us a righteous purpose, it is clear that we will soon win this war and we can finally spend our lives together. I just hope that we as a nation put this peculiar institution behind us and don't try to keep it going under another name. Yours truly, Corporal Noah Little.
During the 1840s, Congress made it law that only U.S. post office employees could deliver letters in the United States, but only letters and only within the borders of the country. This left the door open for private delivery services like Wells Fargo and American Express to handle packages and deliver items outside of the U.S., like on the frontier or across the Wild West. The most famous of these ventures was the Pony Express, which traveled 1,900 miles from Missouri to California. They swapped out a fresh horse every 10 miles and a new rider every 75 to 100 miles. And they made the trip in 10 days, which was unheard of at the time. The Pony Express only lasted 18 months from April 1860 to October 1861, and a number of factors are blamed for its demise, mostly the Civil War and the Telegraph. While those definitely played a part, the Pony Express was never profitable and had lost a quarter million dollars in 1860s money. It was basically a novelty service, the Concord Jet of its time. It was significantly faster than the post office, but the cost of sending a letter was $5, which is almost 100 times more expensive than a stamp, which were relatively new at the time. The first stamp for use in the mail was introduced on the local level in 1845 and cost 5 cents for letters traveling under 300 miles and 10 cents for anything beyond that. The first nationwide stamp was issued two years later in 1847. They got rid of the distance differential during the Civil War because recipients on the front lines kept changing their distance from home. By the 1880s, the cost of a stamp had dropped to just 2 cents and has slowly climbed to 55 cents today. What I find interesting is that when you account for inflation, the cost of sending a letter has been relatively stable over time at around 50 cents. In 2007, they introduced the forever stamps. You buy it once and it's valid forever, regardless of any future price increases. I bought these in 2012 when they were only 45 cents each. These have gone up in value by 20%. They're basically an inflation-proof piece of U.S. currency. If you wanted, you could simply tape 55 cents to your envelope and the post office will still deliver it. I wouldn't recommend stamps as an investment strategy though. Buying stamps for the purposes of collecting, otherwise known as philately, is basically the same as burying money in your backyard. And the post office counts on that. At first, collectors, or philatelists, were seen as a nuisance by the clerks. Why would you buy a stamp if you're not going to use it? Then they realized what an opportunity that was. Nowadays, upwards of 80% of collector's edition stamps are never used, and the post office gets to keep that money, which is way better than how the system used to work. Before stamps, the clerk would just hand you your stack of letters, and you'd look through them to pick and choose which ones you wanted to accept and then you'd pay for them, after they had already gone through the effort of delivering them. It got to a point where people would write short messages on the outside of the envelope so that they could be read and handed back without paying for them. This will be familiar to anyone who abused the collect call system. Hello? Collect call for Mr. Bob, we ought to baby eat a boy. Sorry, wrong number. Switching from a cash on delivery system paid for by the recipient to a stamp system paid for by the sender just made more sense. And that's how private carriers like the Pony Express operated. But over its short lifespan, the Pony Express only delivered 35,000 letters, in contrast to the post office, which was handling 124 million a year at that point. It had become so popular that it was now a problem. During the Civil War, post offices in the North were packed full of people mostly wives waiting to send and receive letters from the soldiers on the front lines. It was like a bank panic every single day. So in 1863, the post office began experimenting with home delivery in urban areas, which necessitated the creation of a standardized address system. When home delivery first started, you just wrote a general description of where that person lived on the envelope. And before that, you used to just send your letters to the post office and wait for the recipient to go in to check and see if they had any mail. Like a P.O. box, only you have to talk to the clerk every single time. Home delivery occurred anywhere from two to four times a day and was so successful that it expanded to rural customers in 1902. Since then, the post office has been legally required to deliver mail to every household in the country. At first, the mailman would knock on your door and hand you your letters, but after a while, mailboxes were invented which allowed delivery even when you weren't home. As of 1934, it is illegal for anyone but the post office to deliver to a mailbox. This 
also necessitated a dramatic shift in the way the post office operated needing fewer clerks and more letter carriers. Over the next 10 years, the post office would close 17,000 offices and would continue that trend to this day. At the same time, the volume of mail more than doubled and continued to grow even through the Depression and World War II, even after home delivery was cut to just once a day in 1950. During Reconstruction, the post office also restructured itself lifting the racial hiring ban and ending political patronage appointments. Up until then, the post office was run by whatever party was in charge. If you were someone's local campaign manager, after they won, you became the local postmaster or police chief. The Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act of 1883 ended that practice, introducing exams and a merit-based point system for federal employment. The only appointed position today is postmaster general. In 1873, they enacted the Comstock Laws, which allowed the Postal Inspection Service to stop any obscene material from being sent through the mail. What counts as obscene? Graphic depictions of anything above the ankle, written descriptions of adult activities, and anything that went against America's strict moral values at the time, including atheist, suffragette, and socialist publications. The turn of the century saw a number of financial crises, including several recessions, bank failures, and stock market crashes, with a particularly bad bank panic in 1907. In response to many Americans losing access to financial services, the post office started a postal banking system in 1910, allowing anyone to deposit up to $500, which they could then withdraw at any other post office around the country. They also offered other financial services like money orders, wire transfers, and check cashing. Though 90% of its income is derived from the sale of stamps, the post office is also the largest savings bank in the country and the largest agency for the transfer of money. It was still the largest bank in the country until it was shut down in 1967. But that wasn't the only innovation from the turn of the century. In 1912, the post office started offering package delivery, known as parcel post, despite protests from private express companies. The service was instantly popular and people sent whatever they could through the mail, including pitchforks, fresh fruit, and live animals such as bees and even children, as long as they were under the 50 pound weight limit. Hey, it was cheaper than a train ticket it. There were publicity stunts as well. Someone sent an entire bank brick by brick through the parcel post. It was the 3D printing of its time. People were so excited to have just about anything show up at their door. Dearest Emma, the war to end all wars is finally over and in a few weeks I'll be home for good. This new piece has given me a chance to take in the sights here in Paris. I've even learned a few new things from the locals that I can't wait to show you. I'm particularly fond of film- Redacted by the United States Postal Inspection Service. I hope this letter finds you well. I paid extra to have the Flyboys deliver it, so it should arrive a little faster, assuming it doesn't end up floating in the Atlantic. I'm also sending this strange rock I found. I thought you might find some use for it. But honestly, I heard they're letting us send packages now, and I just wanted to see what I could get away with. Yours truly, Sergeant Noah L. Mole. After World War I, the United States had an abundance of trained military pilots with nothing to do. Thus, the airmail service was born. The post office already had a vast network of rail cars, which brought delivery times down to just a few days. With the addition of airmail routes, letters could get from coast to coast in just one day. The post office also began home delivery on truck rather than on foot. For the longest time, post offices around the country just used whatever vehicles suited their needs, including dog sleds and reindeer in Alaska. But in 1955, they purchased a standardized fleet vehicle for use around the entire country, the Jeep Dispatcher. It was used until 1984 when it was replaced by an even more iconic vehicle, the Grumman Long Life Vehicle, or LLV. Introduced in 1987, these right-hand drive vehicles built on top of a Chevy S10 chassis get about 10 miles to the gallon and are designed to allow mail carriers to deliver letters without getting out of their seat. Fun fact, these are the only vehicles allowed to use public roads without a license plate. They were only designed to last 24 years and it's been 33. They were also configured for letter delivery, not packages so the post office has been experimenting with new fleet vehicles. Until they pick one, there are still 140,000 LLVs on the road in desperate need of replacement since they have a tendency to randomly catch fire. Hampering mail deliveries is the acute lack of post office space and the slow disintegration of equipment, much of which has not been renewed in years. Most mail trucks are antiquated and require constant repair. 
Some things never change, I guess. But other things do. In order to speed up the sorting process, in 1963, the post office introduced the Zone Improvement Plan, otherwise known as zip codes. The first digit represents one of 10 regions in the United States. The next two digits indicate a state or part of a state. Side note, this is the same year that they came up with those two letter abbreviations for state names. And the last two digits of the zip code are for the individual post offices. People initially resisted the use of zip codes because they feared that numbers would replace the names of their towns. So along with offering reduced rate postage, the post office began a marketing campaign to encourage their use, featuring an orange-faced mailman named Mr. Zip. Meet a fella called Mr. Zip. What he can do for you will really make you flip. So if you have any further postal demands, we're gonna leave you with his hands. You know you gotta have a zip code. Yeah, you got to have a zip code. Everything changed in 1970 when Nixon signed the Postal Reorganization Act in response to a postal worker strike. Having the post office be a government agency was causing problems. Every time any of the seven postal workers unions wanted a raise, or the post office wanted to increase the price of stamps, or try a new product or service, they had to wait for a literal act of Congress. So the Nixon administration turned it into an independent corporation. Postmaster General was no longer a cabinet position, and the post office department officially changed its name to the US Postal Service. Now it was free to innovate and negotiate directly with its workers. This law also required the Postal Service to wean itself off of tax dollars by 1985 and fund itself entirely through postage and other services, which it accomplished two years early in 1983. This is important because this myth persists to this day. The United States Postal Service does not receive any tax dollars and hasn't for almost 40 years. If you aren't buying stamps, you aren't paying for it. Despite that, public perception of the Postal Service declined during the 80s as Reaganomics and libertarian ideas became more mainstream. This was then reinforced through pop culture. The first modern portrayal of a postal worker was Cliff on Cheers in 1982, depicting him as a somewhat obsessed, damaged bureaucrat. Ten years later, Newman on Seinfeld added to that negative stereotype. Let me ask you something. What, what do you do for a living, Newman? I'm a United States postal worker. <laughs> Aren't those the guys that always go crazy and come back with a gun and shoot everybody? Sometimes. That joke was a reference to a spree of postal shootings during the 80s and 90s. These were as common as school shootings are now sometimes occurring twice on the same day. This phenomenon was known as going postal. The postmaster general at the time blamed it on PTSD and the practice of preferring veterans for federal jobs. That would get a big yikes from me, but a lot of media during the 80s played up the ticking time bomb trope in returning Vietnam veterans, so he was hardly the only one to think that. I'm just surprised he didn't try to blame it on aliens. Just about everybody works in a post office as an alien. The next postmaster general had a little more sense and blamed it on stressful working conditions, vowing to modernize and go mostly digital. He set the goal of having optical character readers sort 95% of the mail by 1995. At that point, it was only 38% and they could only read zip codes, not full addresses. The 90s and early 2000s brought a new challenge which everyone thought would finally kill the post office. The internet and more specifically email. But fun fact, the post office actually experimented with an early version of email back in 1982, when it was known as Electronic Computer Originated Mail, or ECOM, though it was more like a fax machine than our modern email. It was really only used by large businesses and banks to send messages amongst one another. It cost 26 cents per page and never really caught on. Despite that, there were several plans by the post office to give every citizen a .us email address, or at least a government address that you could use for official matters, all of which were shot down by Congress. Throughout the Postal Service's history, people have been predicting that some new technology would render the mail obsolete. They said it about the telegraph, the telephone, and most recently email. But here's the thing, the internet has yet to hurt the post office. While there has been a reduction in first class letters, packages and business mail have increased, making up the difference. Though everyone complains about it calling it junk mail. I don't understand why the blame for junk mail is always placed on the post office and not the company who mailed it out. Those companies are the ones paying to deliver it, not you. And they wouldn't send out advertisements and unsolicited credit card offers if they didn't work. You may not like it, but someone is using those coupons. The postal service was turning a profit all 
all through the 90s and 2000s, during a time when everyone said it was obsolete because of email. Surprisingly, use of the post office continued to climb during this period until its peak in 2006 at 213 billion pieces. Then things started to drop off, thanks almost entirely to the 2008 financial crisis. Suddenly, everyone was looking for ways to cut costs, and going to paperless electronic billing seemed like the natural next step, which hurt the post office's business class mail operations twice. First, when the credit card or utility company sends you your bill, and again when you mail the check back. While the overall volume of mail today is only about 66% of what it was before the crash, a larger portion of that mail is made up of packages, thanks in large part to Amazon. Over the last 10 years, the Postal Service has delivered 40% of all Amazon packages, and Parcel Service has increased from 3 billion to 6 billion pieces a year. This would have kept the post office financially stable if not for another major change in 2007. The Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act changed all of that by requiring the Postal Service to prepay its retirement and healthcare benefits several decades in advance. Five billion a year, every year. After the first few years, it simply couldn't keep up and began defaulting on its payments in 2012. This is why people who are pro-privatization get to say that the Postal Service is billions in debt and will continue to be in debt for the foreseeable future. No government agency or private corporation is required to prepay its retirement like this. So when you see videos or articles talking about how the post office wants a taxpayer bailout, that's somewhat deceptive. What they're really asking is to be let out of this stupid obligation. This this one decision accounts for almost 75% of all of the post office's current debt. The rest of it comes from the fact that this law also prohibits the Postal Service from offering any new products or services that don't directly involve the delivery of letters, printed matter, or packages. They are legally prevented from innovating. They couldn't directly sell branded merch anymore, no internet or communication services, and no financial services. This law was designed to slowly bankrupt the Postal Service and its working. Over the last few years, they've talked about ways to save money, including closing offices or cutting Saturday delivery, all of which were again shut down by Congress. The Postal Service is often compared to private carriers like FedEx and UPS. Never mind that FedEx and UPS don't deliver everywhere and often hand off rural packages to the post office, but they also rely on Postal Service airmail contracts to stay afloat. Ah, but they innovate and turn a profit. Yeah, because they don't have a law blocking them from trying new things, and they don't have to prepay the next few decades worth of retirement. It's so stupid that it has to be intentional. Am I out? You've got mail. Huh, I must have forgotten what I was doing there for a second. That was weird. Um, let's check out that email, huh? Hi, Knowing Better. After manually reviewing your video, we've confirmed that it isn't suitable for all- Oh, for- See, this is why my videos are always monetized over on Nebula, a subscription service built by fellow YouTubers where we can innovate and try new things without having to worry about excessive government oversight. Along with original content like working titles, all of my videos are hosted there ad-free, and viewers who watch this video on Nebula are currently seeing a different version of this skit that doesn't include a sponsor. Check it out by also signing up for CuriosityStream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles that you can access across multiple platforms. Sign up for both using the link down below and get 26% off an annual subscription. That's just $14.79. You'll also be supporting the channel when you do. I wasn't expecting anything today. show doesn't make any sense. That whole last season, it felt like there was an episode that was just a deliberate waste of your time. I know some people will say it's part of some master plan, but I can only grade incomplete work, and as it stands right now, there are more questions than answers. Fine, I'll finish talking about the post office. Am I just going to be sitting here explaining government services for the next 25 years? Is she, is she still a dresser drawer? Like, what happened with that? So stupid. 
Do something to save the post office. Call your representatives, or better yet, write to them. Rumor has it that they actually respond to letters since they get to use the mail for free. It's called franking, and I probably should have mentioned it earlier. With it being a census and election year, the Postal Service is more important than ever, and the current Postmaster General is actively slowing it down. This isn't a secret. There are news articles and Reddit posts from postal workers trying to raise awareness about this issue. Ask your postal worker. They come to your door just about every day. Wear a mask when you do. The Founding Fathers created the post office because they saw it as a necessary part of our democracy. Access to information and services. Yes, there are private companies that can do the same things, but they aren't legally required to serve every household. A fact that most people take for granted. Not everyone has access to FedEx or UPS. Not everyone has access to a bank or Western Union. And not everyone has access to broadband internet. Everyone does have access to a post office though. The United States Postal Service is vital to our society because it connects everyone together and allows us to equally participate in our government. And certain people have always been trying to restrict that. Don't let them. Unshackle the post office from these stupid burdens and mail in your ballot if you're able to, because now you know better. I'd like to give a shout out to my newest Golden Fork patron, Marcus. If you'd like to join our little postal union, head on over to patreon.com slash knowingbetter, or for a one-time donation, paypal.me slash knowingbetter. Don't forget to stamp that subscribe button or the join button if you're an avid philatelist. Check out the merch at knowingbetter.tv, follow me on Twitter and Facebook, and join us on the subreddit.